Good afternoon. So I'm here to share with you a little bit of the journey, but really the story behind the story of, of what I do. And I'm going to start with a piece of artwork. Uh, there, beautiful, huh? Where's the artwork? <laughs> there we go. No, There we go. Uh, familiar to everybody, my nine-year-old, he's 17 now, but I have five boys. My son, Hamid, I showed him this piece of art up on the wall, uh, on, on the computer. And I said, Hamid, what do you think of this piece of art? He said, you know, it's dark. He likes the smile. He saw it in a Yu-Gi-Oh cartoon once. You know, 21st century response from a nine-year-old boy. And I said, Baba, what do you think of this? A piece of Islamic art up on our wall. And he looked at it and he said, nothing. And I said, what's the matter? You gave me the opinion on one piece of art. Why not this piece of art? And he said, Baba, it's the Quran. Of course it's beautiful. And therein lies the problem. Because in our culture, art and religion have not been divorced yet, as it has in the Western culture. And I think it all goes back to the second commandment that came to Moses from God. Because religion is not a dummy. Religion knows that before monotheism, people were you know, we're worshipping art objects, we're worshipping statues. And the thing, the difference that happened between, in Europe that has not happened in our part of the world has to do with the fact that for over a thousand years in Europe, the Latin, Latin was the language of instruction. But of course, languages change over the course of time and people started speaking vulgar Latin, right? Which is not allowed into academia or into any kind of use. And so the Catholic Church became more and more extreme. People couldn't contribute culturally because they were disconnected from the language. And then finally, Europe woke up woke up because King Henry really, 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 really wanted that divorce and, and, tra <laughs> and translated the Bible into English, Martin Luther into German, and all of a sudden Europe woke up because the language they spoke in matched the language they thought in, matched the language they wrote in. Meanwhile, we went to sleep. And the relationship between art and, and, and religion in Europe was pretty tight up until the Renaissance. Every prophet came to his people with a miracle. The prophet Moses could turn a stick into a snake because the discourse of the day was magic. But the prophet Muhammad came to Mecca that was rife with poetry and prose. So his miracle was the language in which the Quran came in. But if your miracle is language and language evolves, what do you do? And what we did as a culture is we came up with all kinds of rules to keep it from evolving. And by doing so, what's happened is we've disconnected the relationship between thought, language, and writing. So kids go learn in Arabic in school that they don't speak at home. And so what happens is it's killed creativity, um, and it's, it's killed being able to culturally contribute unless you spoke the classical Arabic, which again, it's reminiscent of Latin and the Pope and extremism. So growing up, uh, I'm Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti parents, but I read the Hardy Boys. I read Nancy Drew. I read anything in English. And I told myself I did it because I didn't like Arabic, because you know, it was forced down, and it just didn't connect for me. And so because I, wrote in English, because I read in English, I wrote in English. And my friends used to make fun of me. I was writing for Kuwaiti newspapers in English. Like, who are you writing for? I mean, this is pre-internet. Who's going to read your stuff? And, but what happened is, is, is I came home at 26 with a copy of this book in English, Cities of Salt. And my mom, who taught philosophy in the Arabic language for 30 years, for 30, 30 years before she retired, said, Naif, you're Arab, he's Arab, how dare you put a translator between the two of you? And I said, no buts. She said, no more buts. I put up with this for a while, you can read this in Arabic. So I did, and I surprised myself. I read all his books, and then Baha Hussein, and Najib Mahfouz. And what occurred to me, finally, is it wasn't that I didn't like the Arabic. It was because the stuff that would have attracted someone like me are banned in the region. They're not allowed. So you have to buy these books in London, New York, or back, back, the back of bookstores in Cairo. And what happens because of this, because of all these rules and the banning of stuff, we end up importing culture. We end up with Spiderman and Superman, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing local, right? People complain, there's stuff coming from the outside. And then you have stuff like you know, the Turkish soap operas that are translated, because you know, the TV stations aren't stupid. Why invest millions of dollars in a show when it can get banned? Just you know, a few thousand bucks, translate, if it gets banned, fine. So in the name of preserving culture, our governments are actually killing it. They're killing it because people who can contribute to culture are being pushed away. Even our stories, we don't tell. I mean, the story of Aladdin, part of our culture for hundreds of years. But who told that story to the world? It wasn't us. It was Disney, right? And I don't know if you guys remember, but the way it opened is, oh, I come from a land from a faraway place where the caravan camels roam, where they don't like your ears. If, if they don't, so where, they, where they cut off your ears, but they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. This was how it was in the theaters. And then the Arab American groups you know, revolted, and the DVD version became different, became tamed. But when somebody else is telling your story, you're not going to be the good guy anymore. You're going to be the bad guy, right? So what do we do about this with all these rules? And so basically with me, I created something called the 99. I did it here in a, in a cab ride going from, London, going from Edgeware Road to Harrods, which is, which is a pilgrimage every Kuwaiti makes once a summer. <laughs> in that cab ride, my sister had told me she wanted me to go back to writing for kids. I used to do that in my mid-20s. I was pushing the idea away. I just done my doctorate, three master's degrees. The, the idea of going back was nutty for me, so I said, for me to go back, it has to be something that has the potential of Pokemon. 
And then I remember there was a fatwa against Pokemon. It's actually not allowed in some places. <laughs> so my next thought was of God, how disappointing he must be. My next thought was that God had 99 attributes in Islam. And that brought me full circle back to Pokemon. By the time I got to Harrods, had the initial idea, raised money using the following pitch. I said, if you look at the superheroes that exist in the world, they're basically based on biblical archetypes. So like the prophets, all the superheroes are missing parents. That meant parents die, die when he's six, Superman on Krypton, uh, Spider-Man's raised by his own uncle, and all of them, like the prophets, have a message delivered from above to a messenger. The prophets get it from God through Gabriel, but Peter Parker is taking the photograph when the spider descends from above and gives him a message through a bite. Superman is not only sent by his parents, the new parents in the Nile, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in a ship like Moses was on the Nile, but you hear the voice of his father saying to earth, I have sent to you my only son. Right? And the reason for this is because there's a Western conspiracy. <laughs> I'm kidding, relax. <laughs> The reason for this is the Bible is known as the greatest story ever told. And so what Hollywood does is they create new storylines and put it on older architecture. So it's familiar and exciting at the same time. So I told my investors, nobody's done this with, with Islam. It's been the bad guys getting their voice out. Let me get in there, pull some archetypes from the Quran, and create new secular storylines based on the architecture, very much how Hollywood does it. And I tell people of all my accomplishments, the one I'm proudest of is I'm the only Kuwaiti that went to Beirut and actually came out with money. Never been done before. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So, so the 99 are from 99 different countries. They're boys and girls. Uh, the girls, some of them cover their hair, some don't. One wears the full niqab. The idea is about diversity and pluralism and everybody being equal. The, in theory, they're from 99 different countries. Um, the story, the back story takes place in 1258, the, fall of, the fa fall of Baghdad at the hand of the Mongols who destroyed Dar al-Hikmah, the most famous library in its day. The books were dumped in the Tigris and the Tigris changes color with ink. I rewrote that story. All that knowledge and wisdom was saved onto 99 stones which were scattered all over the world. And now it's 2014, and the characters find them one by one and become heroes. But they have to work in teams of three. Um, we were able to get the comic book out in several languages, uh, Turkish, Indonesian, etc. The 99 Village theme park launched in Kuwait five years ago. It's only 300,000 visitors a year. It's not Disneyland, but that's more than 10% of our population. Uh, and the TV series is now on global television, from China to the US. It's on Cartoon Network in Mandarin. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in the Middle East on NBC3. It's, and season two has just completed. So we've, this has been an 11-year affair of kind of getting in there, pulling arch archetypes, and challenging the bad guys for the space. So. We were able to do something really cool. There's a crossover series that came out in America that has our characters working with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, who found her clothes after 70 years of looking for them. So <laughs> it took an Arab guy to do this. I'm sorry, guys. Um, this, was, this, was, this brought a lot of acclaim to us, some positive, some very negative. First, I want you to hear directly from something positive, and I'll tell you what this meant for us. Over the past year, the United States has been reaching out and listening. We've joined interfaith dialogues and held town halls, roundtables, and listening sessions with thousands of people around the world, including many of you. And like so many people, you've extended your hand in return, each in your own way, as entrepreneurs and educators, as leaders of faith and of science. I have to say, perhaps the most innovative response was from Dr. Naif al Mutawa of Kuwait, who joins us here tonight. Where is uh, Dr. Mutawa? Right here. His, uh, his comic books have captured the imagination of so many young people with super, superheroes who embody the teachings and tolerance of Islam. After my speech in Cairo, he had a similar idea. So in his comic books, Superman and Batman reached out to their Muslim counterparts. <laughs> and I hear they're making progress, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. So what happened after that? Well, after that, we got our first fatwa <laughs> from Fox News. Oh, wow. Obama's Muslim, and this proves it. He's trying to brainwash your kids with Sharia superheroes. Anybody watching the show will become radicalized and become a jihadi. My favorite was we can't let those Muslims brainwash our children like the Mexicans did with Dora the Explorer. <laughs> this happened, folks. This happened, and what happened is we ended up be de being delayed. Our TV series was bought by The Hub, a joint venture between Discovery and Hasbro, to date has not aired for four years for fear of these extremists in the US. Um, we were able to get on Netflix, but you know, the, the comments on Twitter was, I was called an evil Arab American terrorist, to which I replied, I can't believe you called me American. <laughs> At least get your facts straight. Um, but, I get Twitter campaigns against me from the guys who are supposedly at war with the right wing in America, so the right wing where I live, 
Every few months there's a Twitter campaign. The most intense happened in January, very, very intense, calling for my head more or less. Uh, led to a lawyer in Kuwait who was very ambitious to send a document to the government calling me an apostate, wanted me to be tried for apostasy, which can be done in Kuwait, but the government ignored him. And then, two weeks ago, I got the fatwa from Saudi. Okay? A fatwa. I got a fatwa. The 99 has been called the work of the devil, so congratulations, Skoll. I'm, you have the devil speaking on stage today. Uh, my name was not mentioned in the fatwa, but it basically says that this is evil work that needs to be moved. And it's very interesting, the timing of this, because we've been legal in Saudi for six years. We've been on TV in Saudi for two years. The last episode aired six months ago because of the programming, and the fatwa comes out now. So that tells me one thing. It tells me that we're making some kind of impact. So, you know, this is, we're a social enterprise, and, you know, from the very beginning, one of the things that we, were very, we wanted to do was to change how Islam was being positioned to the world. You know, we've had a lot of, lot of great media, but I guess the best juxtaposition to share with you is the cover of Newsweek from two years ago. Typically, when something has to do with Islam and is on the cover of a magazine, it has to do with destruction. And the fact that we're able to put superheroes makes me very proud. Thank you very much.